I'm joined by uh, Martin Lawler, who is a council member uh, and a partner at Cochrane Kelly. Uh, he's a co-founder of the Solicitor's uh, Growth Fund, um, and he has been, he's a former uh, chair of the Regulation of Practice and the Money Laundering Report Committee. Thank you very much, Justin. Thank you for asking me to come along. It's, uh, it's great to be here uh, today to just share some t minor insights, uh, and they're based probably about around the experience that I've had in delivering talks on this matter, and also based on the my experience of colleagues contacting me with specific queries that they've had that have arisen for them. So, uh, and I've just tried to limit today because it's a short session to just a few things in relation to conveyancing that could pop up from time to time. So Justin, if you wanna flash up there to just give uh, people an idea of what the agenda will be. So we're gonna cover a number of things today. Uh, we're going to look at the assessment rating of solicitors, the general responsibility in relation to AML, business risk assessments, risk-based uh, rather than rules-based client accounts, risk generally, and then I'm going to go into some specific examples. Um, and I, I, I'm very anxious, uh, Justin, to finish at 1.30, if you don't mind, because I have a few other things to do at that stage. So I'll try and we'll try and leave about five minutes or thereabouts to the end, if that's okay with you for questions. Okay. And if anybody has a question, put on the chat. It'd be great, please. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 Justin will keep an eye on the chat, and I obviously I'd like to see, uh, I'd like to see the, uh, the how the chat, uh, um, I'd like to see plenty of activity in the chat. And um, in connection with Martina's question regarding the slides, there I have not prepared a session of slides in relation to this. I'm just going to take you through it. The slides are literally are just to give some headings so that I can follow uh, all the way through. But I'm sure, Justin, you'll have no difficulty in sending uh, out the slides in any event. Um, I suppose the first thing that I'd like to start off with is the assessment, uh, the assessment rating of solicitors nationally from the point of view of anti-money laundering and terrorist finance. And th this is a fairly straightforward issue in as much as that uh, in 2016, solicitors were assessed nationally as to what our risks were or the risk profile that we have in relation to anti-money laundering. And our risk assessment is medium to high high being the highest category, uh, medium being a mid-range. So we're medium to high. And the comment was that we are vulnerable to being sought out and exploited by criminals who seek to launder the proceeds of crime or evade tax. That was the comment that was put uh, in relation to it. And as a result of that, uh, we, we are a body and an organization, and particularly given that we handle clients in certain uh, transactions, we are a body and an organization, therefore, that will be looked at um, in that particular categorization of medium to high. Obviously, we're not as high, perhaps, as casinos or other places like that, but we are in the medium to high range. And because of that, um, I, the, I, we, have, we have higher responsibilities in relation to anti-money laundering and terrorist finance than ordinary citizens have. Ordinary citizens have the general responsibility not to be involved in anti-money laundering or not to be involved in terrorist finance. But we have higher responsibilities because of the fact that we've been categorized as, um, uh, uh, as people who supply services in specific areas that the anti-money laundering legislation uh, uh, re requires us to perform certain tasks and certain duties. One of those tasks, uh, particularly for business owners, is the preparation of the business risk assessment. And following from the business risk assessment, we have the policies, controls, and procedures under which the firm operates. And then we have the client risk assessment, which is what the individual dealing with the client will do on a, uh, on, on a basis and must do throughout the transaction and during the course of uh, dealing with the transaction we also document our thoughts and finally there must be ongoing training uh, in relation to anti-money laundering the changes that are being brought about as a result of the various directives from the European Union the changes that have been brought about from a legislative point of view and the changes that have been brought about in terms of the risk profile uh, as money laundering worldwide is assessed where people see the vulnerabilities and um, who would have known that for example 10 years ago picking an entirely different topic that cybercrime would become such an important issue at uh, at this stage 
Um, and yet it is a very important issue and there's vulnerabilities being exposed every day of the week in terms of fishing uh, and areas of that nature. So anti-money laundering is not just one simple, straightforward, this is anti-money laundering, as criminals are very, very, very creative people. And as a result, they will change the mode and operation in which they operate in. One of the features about anti-money laundering and the anti-money laundering regime is that it is a risk-based rather than a rules-based process. As a rules-based process, it would be somewhat simple. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do the other. Whereas in anti-money laundering, it is requiring people like us to assess risk and to take a look at risk and to then make a conclusion arising from that risk as to whether the, a risk assessment as to whether there is the prospect of um, a transaction or transactions uh, requiring uh, um, perhaps a suspicious transaction report, um, which I don't propose to deal with today. Um, but when we look at those particular areas um, in, 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 our, in, in our practices, the responsibility comes on to us rather than to rely on a rule. <clears throat> and the one of the big risks that we have is that we operate a client account and a client account is a great device because it enables us to hold and trust client monies and it enables transactions to be completed relatively seamlessly um, and it ensures that there are that, that we are like um, the the person in the middle holding the funds there to make sure a transaction gets across the line but client accounts have changed radically uh, since, since they were introduced back in the 1950s. In as much as at that stage, the lodgements of clients account were done by way of checks or they were done by way of cash. Nowadays, the vast majority of transactions involving the client account are done by EFT. And EFT means that somebody who is not at the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the punter sitting in front of you can actually lodge money into your client account. And this sometimes presents vulnerabilities. And it is in that particular context that I just want to give, I want to tease through a couple of examples here today and see, uh, and the chat would be very interesting in this respect to see if people have come across these uh, examples themselves and do people have solutions in relation uh, to the examples. But if I can go just go back up for one moment to the, uh, the, the reason why we use a risk-based approach or why legislation use a risk-based approach, it's because no transaction is the same. No client is the same. So to have a hard and fast rule r removes a huge amount of discretion and it could interfere considerably with the world of commerce. And that's why we've been asked to look at at compliance with anti-money laundering with our common sense hat on, not our Inspector Poirot, Inspector Clouseau, we have to look into every aspect of it, but at the same time, uh, al allowing us uh, the flexibility to make sensible decisions regarding the risks associated with a particular transaction or with a particular client from an anti-money laundering uh, point of view, as opposed to having a hard and fast rule that says you can't do this or you can't do that. So one of the examples that I wanted to look at here uh, today was uh, in relation to acting for a purchaser. So uh, one is acting for a purchaser. The purchaser uh, outlines to you that they are going to purchase this property, but they're getting some money from their parents. And um, so the purchaser says, my 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 father and mother are going to give me some money. And what do you do in that particular uh, situation? The parents are clearly not your client, but at the same time, money is being supplied by them. Now, perhaps if the money is sent into your own client's bank account and then transferred by EFT into your bank account, you can note the fact that yes, there is some of the proceeds of coming here that they are coming via the parents uh, and that they are coming through the 
uh, uh, who are giving the money directly to the client who in turn is sending it on to you. But that really doesn't deal with your obligations in relation to assessing the risk associated with the transaction. And bear in mind that in conveyancing transactions, the very good guidance on this, by the way, from, uh, from the Law Society, that you have to assess the risk associated with any transaction at the start, the middle, and at the end. And you may change the rating. You may have it at low, 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 but you may change it from low to medium to back down to low again during the course of the transaction. So you've set out here and uh, you're dealing with uh, uh, with your client uh, who tells you that they're getting money from the parents. What do you do in that situation? I would suggest the first thing that you probably need to do apart from assessing your own client from the point of view of uh, anti-money laundering and source of funds, is you'll need to find out a, a bit about the profile of the parents. They tell you that the parents are both, one is a retired teacher and the other is uh, a, a farmer and that farmer is still farming away. And the amount of the deposit is 30 to 40,000 euro that they're giving to um, to your, your, um, to, uh, to your client. That sounds to me like it would be reasonable. It's consistent with what the parents uh, have, um, uh, you know, had their work career. It would be consistent with uh, the known income. It's 40,000. It's not 4 million. So that looks like it is something that you would be in a position to say, from a risk point of view, I've taken a look at this matter and I'm satisfied about it. But if if your client doesn't tell you that the parents are going to supply the money, if your client uh, sits down with you and says, yeah, yeah, I have the money. And then uh, you look at your client bank account one day and you see a lodgement that has come in from Mr. and Mrs. X and Y in relation to this transaction. What do you do in those circumstances? Do you say, OK, I, I think I know what that's about. Or do you say, no. I'm going to send that money back out again. I'm going to perform my due diligence. I'm going to assess the matter from a risk point of view. And then I'll make my mind up as to whether I, I think that there's anything, any risk profile here that requires looking at this matter from the point of view of being a, a suspicious transaction. So, so it does present a problem because the money will have been lodged directly to, the, to your client account. And how does it end up being lodged to your client account? Probably because most of us nowadays use letters of engagement. And in the letters of engagement, a number of us probably put down our client bank account details. And I would suggest that perhaps that practice would be looked at by a firm, that a firm might say, do you know what? I'm not going to do that anymore. What we're probably going to do is we're probably going to put in a, a note to say, uh, transfers are to be in by EFT, please telephone the office in order to get the details of the client bank account or to include the last couple of numbers of the client bank account and to ask that they would ring the office in order to get the remaining numbers of the client bank account. So at, at the very least, you're, it, it's, it doesn't become as simple as... Uh, a, a child sent to the parents, oh, here's the details, without necessarily telling you that the funds have come in um, uh, uh, or to expect that the funds are going to come in. So in relation to this, uh, in, in relation to this particular example, you have a, a child who has omitted to tell you, or a client, I suppose, rather than a child, has omitted to tell you that funds are coming from a particular source and those funds come into the into the bank account. What do you do in those circumstances in that situation? And I am suggesting to you that you'll take a good, long, hard look at it, but you may well want to take a view that the funds have to go back out again until such time as you've performed your due, due diligence. In, in a lot of cases, you won't do that. And there, you could have a very good reason for doing that because going back to what I've said earlier on, on your risk assessment, you've decided that the risk here of uh, anti-money laundering is extremely low indeed. Now, Martin, possible just look at the chat. There's a specific around this uh, brought up by uh, Pepe there in case of money from parents. Yes, yeah. I can see it here. In case of money from parents towards the bottom, aren't the banks now asking for specific waivers from parents that would enable facilitate the necessary checks to be carried out. 
That's a great question because, of course, one of the problems is that uh, just because the bank have passed it through doesn't mean that you can rely on the bank or you can rely on any third party because your requirement in relation to risk is that you must assess the risk. Now, you could probably say as part and parcel of your risk assessment to say, yes, I was in touch with the bank, the bank are satisfied about it, but you have to look at the transaction in the in its entirety. You have to look at the source of funds in their entirety. And I'm going to come to this later on in relation to relying on uh, risk registers, because again, the view is that the risk registers are great tools, but you can't rely on them absolutely. And uh, because you must, as part and parcel of your AML obligations, uh, uh, always assess risk during the course of the transaction. So yes, it is a good point to say that the uh, banks are looking for waivers. Generally, I think those waivers though relate to uh, the parents not having a, a comeback on the monies at a later stage uh, that uh, um, in, in the event that, 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 the, that the child defaults. But um, I, I'm, I'm interested to, to see that, but per perhaps it is, a, a, I, I'm interested to hear about that specific waivers uh, provision there. So the second example I want to have a look at here is acting for a purchaser and there's a change of instructions in relation to the balance of money. So you're acting for a purchaser. Yeah, you've, you've the deposit has been paid. The purchaser tells you, I'm, um, I'm, I'm getting a loan from the local credit union and everything is flying along and uh, you ask for the balance of funds and lo and behold, the funds come in from a bank account in Western Australia. And uh, then the, you check with the client and the client says, well, actually what happened was my brother has been working in the mines out there in the last couple of years. He's gathered a lot of money together. I mentioned to him that I was buying the house. He said to me, look, I'm getting nothing on deposit here. If you pay me a better interest rate, I'll loan you these monies. Um, and uh, and that's what happened. What do you do in that situation? And again, you're back to assessing the risk uh, uh, scenario. You may well say, I leave the phone sit there until I do my, uh, do my due diligence. Or you may have to make a decision to say the funds go back out until I uh, do the due diligence. But you do have a problem here because the funds have now come in from a different source. That's a red flag. And if you take a look at any of the Law Society guidance in relation to this, or indeed any general guidance, that is a red flag. A last minute change of instructions is always regarded as a red flag. Monies coming from outside of the European Union are regarded as a red flag. Um, and remember now that the UK is outside of the European Union, so you need to you need to be cognizant uh, of that. Australia is not on any particular risk list or anything like that, but it is outside of the European Union. So you're going to need to take a good, long, hard look at this um, before you 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 make any commitment. Let's just say, if we can move on there, Justin, please. You're acting for a vendor. Now, this has happened a couple of times to uh, to people who have contacted me. So they're acting for the vendor. And on their contract for sale, they've put down the details of their own um, um, client bank account. And the purchaser solicitor has made the vendor solicitor aware of the contents of the contract. And lo and behold, stuck in there is the details of the client bank account of the vendor solicitor. Um, and the purchaser then lodges the deposit directly with you. So what are the implications of that? Clearly, you'd start from the point of view of saying, well, the purchaser is not my client. So therefore, do I have an issue because I'm not acting on behalf of the purchaser? I'm simply taking in the purchaser's money and holding it in trust. Or do you say, mm, I don't like the look of this. I think that I need to consider sending this money back. And from my point of view, I would take the view that you opt for the, the safest course of action, which is to send the money back, notify the purchaser solicitor that, the, that these funds were lodged directly into your account and ask the purchaser solicitor to uh, 
contact uh, her or his client and to say, look, that's not on the cards. The funds must be routed, uh, must be routed uh, through us. Another, another one is where you're acting for the vendor and the purchaser is absolutely, totally and utterly out of time in terms of closing. You've served 28 day notice and lo and behold, just as about to expire, the purchaser lodges the monies, but lodges them directly with your client, the vendor, who sends them on to you. And again, what do you do in that situation? The funds have come from your uh, own client who has got them directly from the uh, from the purchaser. Obviously, the first thing that it would go into your head is that well, this purchaser has a large amount of money they're not relying on a bank loan. They're not relying on anything of that nature. And yet they're paying it directly to uh, my client because they know they want to try and avoid uh, the 28-day notice expiring. They don't want to go into their own uh, solicitor's bank account because their solicitor might say it'll take a couple of days for the funds to clear, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you are, you are now caught in a position whereby you have these funds and, uh, They've been sent into you by your own client. And what do you do in that scenario there? And again, you're, you're going to need to consider very, very, very carefully what approach you take in relation to it. Clearly, your client will want to have the balance of proceeds of sale. You're caught in the dilemma that you served a 28-day notice. The funds clearly have now been paid. So the 28-day notice is now uh, of uh, no longer of any relevance. And Again, I would be saying first point of contact here is go back to your colleague and say to your colleague, these funds have come in here. I don't know the source of them. You undoubtedly know the source of them. I am not handling these funds. I'm going to send them straight back to your client and let your client close the sale in the ordinary way. Um, um, I now want to deal, and I know we're running very tight on time here. I want to deal with the question of politically exposed persons. What is a politically exposed person? Politically exposed person is a very broad category of, I call them ordinary citizens, simply because there are categories of uh, of citizens who are extraordinary, like say Supreme Court judges, government ministers, people of that nature who are politically exposed persons. But there is a category of ordinary citizens who are politically exposed persons and you won't be aware of it. And those ordinary citizens are those people who are generally volunteers who are part and parcel of the governing body of various political parties. So you could have a political party that is, uh, you know, the uh, the Ireland for Growth Independence Party. It could have four members on its governing body. And because they it is a registered political party, they are politically exposed persons. and. And their family members are politically exposed persons. And you won't know this. I mean, I certainly won't know it. I discovered only the other day that a client of mine is a politically exposed person because that client is on the governing body of, of a political party. I didn't know that the client was a politically exposed person. And um, it, it is it, when, when somebody is a politically exposed person, you have to... Um, you have to apply enhanced due diligence in relation to that. You have to look at the transaction with a very, very, very jaundiced eye. Now, obviously, this is one of the situations whereby, um, uh, uh, you know, how how do we know? How do I know that, um, uh, you know, that my client Jane A ACME is the daughter of Barbara ACME? Barbara ACME being a member of the Executive Council of Fine Gael and who quite extraordinarily managed to end up with a lucrative uh, PR contract uh, from the government that is now the subject of a major investigation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And here I am acting away for Jane ACME, uh, who, is, who is buying a property and she tells me that she's getting money from her mother uh, but it turns out, in fact, that the money, when it comes in, comes in from a, a, from ACME PR Limited, uh, Barbara's company. Again, 
because of the uh, the 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 fact that that uh, Barbara is a, a PEP, Jane is a PEP, and you have to apply enhanced due diligence uh, in relation to it. We had a very interesting question that came in, Justin. Yep, and it came in in relation to a company, a a, 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 a UK company that is operating a property here in Ireland. And the question that related to it was, what are the requirements from a due diligence point of view that should be undertaken in connection with the, with, with this? And the, the, I suppose the first thing that needs, you need to be aware of is that it's a UK company. So now it's outside of the EU. So that there is a red flag for you straight away. You're going to need to have the constitution of the company. You're going to need to do a company's office search in the UK in relation to uh, the directors and the shareholders of the company. You're going to need to get um, a, 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 a in, in Ireland is called the Register of Business Ownership uh, search against the company, but in the UK it's called uh, persons having substantial control search. So you want to see who is who's a, above a twenty five percent shareholder in the company. Anybody who's above a twenty five percent shareholder, you need you're going to need to get your know your client due diligence identification documents, and you're going to need to get your you're going to need to get your proof of address. Uh, and you're also going to need that for anybody who's above a 25% shareholder in the company because they're 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 above the threshold on beneficial ownership. But if, for example, when you do the company's office search in the UK and you discover that in fact there's maybe 10 to 15 shareholders, but they're all family members, that might alert you to the fact that there could be a possibility here that the company structure is such that there is an attempt being made to keep them below the 25% that is the requirement uh, for registration of persons of substantial control. So that might cause you some concern in relation to it. And of course, finally, you will be looking, uh, if the company is buying a property, you'll be looking at uh, the source of funds uh, in, 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 relation, uh, in relation to that. I know we're very, uh, I know we're very close uh, to uh, finalizing here. As you'll see from Sharon is using open source is sufficient to carry out enhanced due diligence, including adverse media checks. Yes, open sources. Uh, again, you're down to this thing. You're down to this business here of wh what is, you're documenting your thought process. What is the sensible thing here? Is there any red flags here that really alert me or concern me in relation to uh, an individual or in relation to a transaction. So yes, open sources are, are, are extremely good. I, I don't see the reason to use credit reference checks um, uh, at this stage, but if something becomes sufficiently of concern to you, you might do. What's the best and cheapest way to check people against international sanctions list in my experience and um, you go on the there is a number of uh, websites the names of which I don't have at the moment but they uh, are they're there you can you can just simply google international sanctions and that is probably the cheapest way of of uh, checking that it's very important to do that in relation to uh, particularly in relation to sanctions regarding Ukraine and um, but also to use to, to, to use those uh, the, the, that information in relation to countries that are regarded as high risk. In high risk countries, again, that's another big red flag. So a red flag for a country outside of the EU, like Australia, you wouldn't really be regarding it as a major red flag, but those countries that are on high risk, yes, you will be, you, you will be regarding that as a red flag. So Justin, we're just at half past one. Um, I'm going to let uh, I'm going to stop it there at this stage. And uh, if there's any other questions that people have, if you want to pop them to Justin, I will uh, I, I will arrange to uh, send them uh, send send on any responses to them. And I'll I'll pull down the uh, list of those websites. They are also available on the Law Society guidance, which is great. Use the Law Society AML guidance. It is really, really good. Uh, the uh, small practices AML guidance is great and the business hub. And also you can also go on the central bank website. They have a very, they have very good guidance as well too. 
Okay. Thank you very much, Justin. So Martin, that, thanks a million for, uh, for uh, cramming so much into such a short period period of time. I think it's given everybody a real, real nice flavor of what's happening. And there's, there's lots to be done on it, but uh, thanks for making it a lot clearer to us. So Great. everyone, that's our last uh, information session of the autumn series. Hopefully we'll be back in the new year with a, a new range of information services. Anyone would like to email me with some suggestions, that would be great. Martin, again, thanks for being such a good sport today and uh, helping us out for, for, for 30 minutes of really uh, a crash course uh, AML. And, uh, thank you. Gurmagad for having me, Justin. Slán. Yep. Slán is Gurmagad.